Well, hello everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Ian Mosley. I'm delighted uh, to welcome you to the second of our Power Electronics webinars of our powerful series of training. Um, today's seminar will last about one hour. Um, we've done an intro already earlier this week, just to the broad concepts of why we want power electronics uh, in our, in, you know, in, in, in our lives. Um, and today's webinar, we're starting to get into a little bit more technical detail. This series of webinars will be running all the way through to December, and we're covering a very wide range of, of all sorts of aspects of power electronics. Today's webinar is all about AC to DC conversion and DC to AC conversion, and we're going to talk about applications and how that can be done and some of the problems and benefits of using power electronics in that environment. Um, I'm pleased that I'm joined today by Jose Gonzalez from Warwick University. Jose is going to be presenting some of our later webinars, talking about some of the real detailed aspects of, uh, of high-performance silicon carbide power transistors. And today, um, Jose has kindly agreed to help moderate the, um, the, the questions and polls side of our webinar. So if you look on the right-hand side of your screen, you should see a box where you can ask, type in questions. We'll go through those questions at the end of today's webinar. Um, and Jose will also be kicking off some polls throughout the, the webinar today, just to help us understand whether the content we're presenting firstly is useful to you, and also um, whether you think it's of the right sort of technical level. Uh, I'd really appreciate your feedback on that. Um, this is a bit of an experiment for us. Uh, there's also a chat box, so if you want to chat to your buddies uh, whilst you're online, please feel free to do that. Um, so uh, I guess without hesitation, I shall now get into the, 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 the content of our seminar today, which is going to be um, on, on the slides here if I just share my screen. Um, bear with me just a moment. Okay, so I do hope you can see that okay. Um, uh, this webinar is, is all about AC to DC and DC to AC conversion. So if I start... Um, to progress, the sort of things we're going to talk about today. Uh, firstly, why on earth do we want to convert between those two forms of electricity um, uh, to AC to DC, DC to AC? Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the two main types of, uh, of AC to DC conversion, which is passive and active rectification. And then towards the end of the webinar today, then we're going to talk about how you can go the other way, how you can actually go back to AC from a DC source and why you might want to do that. Um, the webinar is about an hour long. There'll be about 10 to 15 minutes for questions at the end. So do save those up and I hope we can answer them on the, on the, on the webinar today. So why convert between these forms? So from a point of view of energy transmission, power is generally transmitted using AC around the country. 50 or 60 hertz is uh, are the typical frequencies. You do get some cases where you have high voltage DC links between countries because it's just more efficient to transfer energy at very, very high DC voltages between countries. But for most domestic transmission, it's down at AC levels um, uh, that you, you, you can see out and about. Um, why do we want to convert that? Well, most electronic systems that you would go and buy need a DC voltage to run. They can't operate from an AC voltage unless it's something um, like a heater, perhaps, or an incandescent light bulb. Pretty much all the other systems need a DC input. Um, also, those electronic systems uh, that need DC power need that typically that DC power to be isolated from the incoming AC feed. And that's a pure safety thing. You can't have, even if you've got a low voltage DC power, you can't have that galvanically connected to the AC incoming feed because you're going to get a, a, a nasty situation if you do that. So you need an isolation barrier there. And most isolated uh, switch mode power supplies the topologies only operate from a DC input. Um, you, you can't operate, operate them natively from an AC input. And I've given an example here of a, of a power supply you might find in a typical desktop computer. Um, in our case, this would be a single phase feed coming in. The front end of that converter, we've got um, an AC to DC converter, which generates a high voltage DC link. That then runs through a second stage DC to DC stage, uh, which provides the galvanic isolation I've just been talking about. And then on the output side, we have rectification, and that produces all the various voltage rails. And in, in the case of this um, computer power supply, we might have 12 volts, 5 volts, and 3.3 volts. Um, so that's a, a fairly sort of standard application of, of, of an AC to DC conversion system. DC to AC conversion, why do we want to go back again? Um, there's, there's many reasons why we want to do that. Firstly, if we've got some micro generation, say 
for example, a, a solar farm, we're generating power natively in DC. Now, if we're going to feed that back onto the grid, we need to turn that back into AC. So in those solar farms, we have a DC to AC conversion block. And I've given a, a bit of a diagram of what that might look like here on the slide. Um, the first part of that in this example actually is an isolated DC to DC converter to step the output voltage from the solar panels up to a high voltage DC link uh, and implement uh, maximum power point tracking and all that sort of stuff you have for micro generation. That high voltage DC link then feeds a second stage inverter. And this inverter is then what turns that high voltage DC back into an AC signal or an AC um, uh, waveform which can then be synchronized and fed back out to the grid. So that's a very good example of DC to AC conversion that's commonly used in practice. Another very common application of variable speed motor drives. Most high power motors operate on AC, three phase AC. Um, and traditionally you would run, run that just from 50 Hertz mains, but that's a very inefficient way to operate the system. For variable speed drives, what you actually have is an input AC to DC stage, whereby the three phase mains input is converted to a high voltage DC link. And then we have a three phase inverter on the output and that can create a variable frequency AC supply to the motor to allow it to turn. And that, that essentially allows us a, a much more controllable and efficient system compared to previous technology. Um, Good example of that would be an electric vehicle where you have a, a big EV battery feeding that DC link here and driving the motor. Um, another example, um, this is, I just put this one in because I think it's a useful little reference. Um, there are very low cost solar uh, uh, inverters you can buy to put in your car, for example, to generate a, a mains power level from a 12 volt car battery. Um, these things are very, very cheap. Uh, and the way they operate, I'm gonna describe in a slide later in this webinar, um, but that's another application where you've got a DC energy source and you need an AC output from it. So these are, these, this particular example is one way we can, we can do that. It's a bit of a cheap way of doing it, but it, it is feasible. Uh, another really interesting application, and one I'm particularly fascinated by, um, is something called Class D audio. Uh, you may have come across this before. Essentially, with Class D audio, what we're doing is we're operating a power stage with the output transistors on or off. And actually, if you take a look at it, the output power stage is, is almost identical to the inverters that I showed you in the, um, in the earlier examples, the, 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 motor speed drive, the motor drives and the, uh, the micro inverters there. The difference with um, an inverter used for Class D audio is it has to be far more linear uh, because any non-linearity causes problems. People just don't like that. Um, for many years, Class D audio had a bit of a bad reputation because of the distortion mechanisms caused by dead time in the power stages and other bits and pieces and non-idealities. Um, however, there's been a, a quite a renaissance uh, in Class D technology now. Um, in particular, this example here is um, a company called Ice Power, which is owned by Bang & Olufsen. Um, and they've implemented and built a, a set of uh, Class D modules. This example is a 500 watt capable Class D amplifier in a size footprint of nine by nine by two and a half centimeters, um, delivering fantastic performance levels. So for example, in that footprint, we get 500 watts at 0.02% THD. And at 93% efficiency, that's way, way higher than you'll ever achieve from a normal linear amplifier, uh, which allows you to make that power density of that system much higher. So um, Class D audio is a little bit of an abstract application for DC to AC conversion, but one that you'll find increasingly common now in high power audio systems. Um, Another really good example is the uh, is the um, e-mobility industry and the growth of electrification of uh, transport. And I wanted to use this particular example as a, a, of a system that's operating multiple stages of power conversion, each of which need to be very high efficiency to manage the, um, the performance of the overall system. Um, so in this case here, we have our electric vehicle and I've shown the key blocks of that the energy will be processed by to go from the three phase or single phase input from the main supply all the way through to the power that's driving the wheels of that vehicle. Um, and you can see here there's multiple stages. On the front end, we have an active rectifier. Um, I've not 
described yet what an active rectifier is. I'll do that in a few slides time. But essentially, an active rectifier is going to turn that three phase AC into a high voltage DC. We have a second stage isolated DC to DC converter, which is used to charge the battery. It's a, just a big battery charger effectively. This battery then drives the inverter of the car to turn that DC energy back into high frequency or higher frequency AC energy, a three phase energy, which can drive the motor with variable speed. So they're the key building blocks for an electric vehicle powertrain. Now, where those different blocks sit depend on whether you're charged or depend on how you're charging your car. For example, um, for, for lower power charging, what call it, people often call it AC charging, what happens is all of those power converter blocks that I've just described sit, on, sit inside the car, and actually the first two blocks are known as the onboard charger. Um, so there's a box of electronics on your car. Typical rating of that might be somewhere between um, 7 or 11 kilowatts, something like that. There are some examples of much higher power, but they're less common now. Um, uh, single phase or three phase input, but normally single phase for that power level. Um, and essentially all the charging station is doing is, is connecting uh, or authenticating you as a user and then connecting the AC supply onto the front end of the onboard charger on the car and then the car takes over. Um, the world of DC charging is slightly different. So that these boxes of electronics, you can't make them too high power because all of the time, if it's an onboard charger, it's sitting on the car driving around. So above a certain power level, it's not economically sensible to have that sat on the car. So if you want to charge at higher rates than uh, I've just described here, you can use DC charging. And in DC charging, what happens is those first two blocks, the active rectifier and the isolated DC to DC converter stage, well, they shift out and they sit in a box in the bottom of this charging station. And then the output of that charging station is natively DC and is connected in the car directly to the battery. So we bypass the onboard charger. Um, and that allows us to get to unbelievably high charging levels. You know, people are looking at, uh, uh, well, certainly uh, above 100 kilowatt capable systems. And that's going higher and higher all the time for, for bigger vehicles. Um, so that, that's a nice example of, of, of the multiple conversion stages you're finding in some of the new technologies that are becoming uh, common in the marketplace now. So I, um, I mentioned at the start of this webinar, passive rectification. Um, and this, this is very, very commonly used. Uh, and I want to just show you what I mean by this. So passive rectification um, on a single phase system is about the most basic thing that you could imagine. Um, in this example here, actually, it's just a single phase line one and neutral normally. You have a bridge, a bridge rectifier, which then feeds a bulk capacitor. And what happens is that as your mains is moving up and down, the capacitor actually just cap recaptures the DC content of that waveform once it's been peak rectified. So um, the output of this bridge rectifier will look like a full wave rectified sinusoid. So imagine it goes in, it's bipolar, it comes out of the bridge rectifier, it's looking a little bit, you got it is unipolar, uh, full wave rectified, and then the capacitor is smoothing that voltage just to recapture a DC level. Um, and that sounds simple, and it is, it's very, very simple, but it causes problems. Um, and I thought the best way to explain the problems that this causes is to get in the lab and actually measure it. So I built uh, a simple uh, bridge rectifier exactly as you can see here, uh, four diodes, and I think it was a 220 microfarad bulk capacitor. I ran the power from our artificial main supply. So the artificial main supply gives you very pure sinusoidal mains. And what I'm showing, well, I'll show you when I play this video in just a moment, is the mains voltage and the current actually drawn on the phase. So I've got a current probe sitting on the line input here to show you the nature of the current. So take a look at this, and you'll see why it's not a good idea at high power. So I start to wind the power up on the output of this system. Look what's happening to the current. It's pretty horrible, isn't it? <laughs> um, you can see here that we're just pulling power. We're pulling current from the mains just at the top of the main cycle. And it's because the capacitor here is, is essentially acting like a peak charging unit. When the output voltage of the, or when the voltage of the mains is below the DC voltage here, there's no current flow in these rectifiers. It drops to zero. 
as soon as the mains voltage goes above the output here, we get an inrush of current into here that's limited only really by the impedance of the mains supply, which is in, normally inductive and resistive. So that's a pretty horrible waveform. And in, in this particular example, just to put this in context, um, sorry, just to put this in context, for that um, particular load when the video stops, I was pulling about 200 watts on the output. So 200 watts of, of resistive output energy. The input supply was 240 volts RMS and I measured the input current was 1.85 amps RMS. Um, now that gives us something called our VA rating of our, um, of our system here as being 444 VA. It's just 240 times 185. Um, and the reason that's, that's a problem is that for pushing and generating 200 watts of useful energy on the output or useful power on the output, I'm actually stressing the mains feed here at an equivalent level of a 444 VA. So with a very uh, um, distorted current here, what actually happens is for a given output power level, the mains is having to the mains feed is having to work incredibly hard to deliver that. And you can imagine utility suppliers don't like that very much. We represent that um, that poor quality by something called the power factor. A power factor of unity is perfect. That would be an ideal resistive load and nice sinusoidal waveforms. Uh, we've got a power factor of 0.45, which is terrible. And as you, as you go up in power level, you can see that this would just become a horrendous problem. So what happens if we then go to three phase passive rectification? Um, oh, sorry, before I go that, I am um, before I talk about three phase, this is a really interesting plot. So I mentioned this was the output sinusoidal voltage from our um, uh, artificial main supply. Uh, so it's a nice pure sine, sine wave. However, for comparison, I, I grabbed the scope plot of the mains just coming out the wall. What does it look like? And you can see here, the mains coming natively out the wall has got rather a flat top on it. And the reason for that is that there's so many of these little power supplies set around in the offices and buildings we have that are only pulling current here at, at, right at the top of the mains voltage waveform. So if you imagine the feed coming in from the, from the external transformer, all of a sudden it just sees a huge amount of current at the top and that means we get voltage drop uh, on the on the on the power cables feeding feeding out the local supply and it causes this flat top behavior which causes real problems and harmonic issues uh, uh, further back in the grid so that's why if you look at mains voltages they have a flat top it's because of this sort of current flow so moving back onto three phase now um, I did the same thing here. We've actually got a, a lab power supply behind me in the lab, which has got a three phase input. And it's uh, I, I realized actually it's got um, just passive rectification on, on its front end. And I thought I'd use it to try and capture some waveforms. So I fed that, three that, 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 that DC power supply via our three phase power analyzer just to take a look at um, what, what the currents and voltages look like. Now this was for a slightly higher output power. I, I, was, I was pulling about nearly three kilowatts from the mains at this point. So you can see here on the top, or hopefully you can see on the top of the plot, we have the phase voltage waveforms from um, the three phases. Um, these are all the uh, line to neutral voltages, by the way. Uh, so 230 volts RMS. On the plot below, you can see the current that's being pulled on each of those phases. So it's slightly different. We'd have two pulses now per main cycle on each phase. But in terms of the nature of that waveform, you can see it's got the same horrible harmonic behavior that we saw on a single phase system. Um, uh, and again, this creates real problems for the grid. It's just a nasty way to generate DC, high power DC from AC. You just shouldn't be doing this. Um, so that's, that's the main difference here. Uh, if you take a look at the um, power analyzer display at this point, we were pushing across all three phases, we were pushing two point or drawing 2.78 kilowatts of useful power. But this VA rating I've spoken about before under this particular case for three phase, we were pulling um, pretty much twice that power level in terms of, or sorry, that, 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 that the VA rating is almost twice the, the power level in watts. So again, the power factor for this, if we look down to, is about 0 0.53, 0 0.52, something like that. It's a horrible way to operate the mains. Um, 
if you want to, or uh, the, the way we define power factor, I'm going to show in, in, on the next slide, actually, uh, or in, in a moment, sorry. So uh, harmonics and distortion. This the the paralyzer power analyzer itself has a harmonic uh, capability, so it can look at the three current waveforms that we're drawing here, the nasty spiky ones, and it can look at the harmonic content of those. Um, and most standards require you to measure up to about the fiftieth harmonic. Uh, if you're running fairly low power, so up to sixteen amps per RMS per phase. Uh, then you can use standard uh, EN 61000-3-2, and that I'll show you a part of that in a, minute, in a moment, which tells you how much harmonic energy or how much harmonic current you can have. Um, if you're running much higher power systems, uh, EN 61000-3-12 covers up to 75 amps RMS per phase um, with different sorts of requirements on, on harmonic levels. Um, so if I now look at our 61,000-3-2, uh, so a lower power system, if you look into that standard, you can see that there's a number of uh, classifications of equipment. So there's class A, which is balanced three phase and typical sort of household type stuff. So that's the vast majority of the, of the bits and pieces you'll find in a typical office as well. Um, portable tools, lighting equipment, and computers and monitors and TVs have their own special class because there's so many of them around the place that they have a disproportionate impact on, on, on power quality. Um, if we take a look at class A, which is the sort of typical um, everyday type equipment, you can see that the limits for class A equipment, they're not actually uh, ratios. There are maximum absolute levels that you have to stay below uh, in order to be compliant to this particular standard. Um, and in this case here, this is the harmonic content of that three-phase system that I showed you in the, the, the waveforms on the previous slide. The fundamental here is the very first bar, um, and I think the fundamental here is at 3.89 amps. The second one is down at 1.68 amps, something like that. So the, the, the um, sorry, it's actually it's the third harmonic, not the second. You tend to only, if, with, with a distortion, you get on... Uh, these systems, it tends to be very symmetrical, which means the majority of the harmonic energy tends to be concentrated into the odd, or, odd order harmonics. So you can see here, we've got a fundamental um, 50 hertz content at 3.9 amps, but we've got significant content at 150 hertz of 1.7 amps. Um, so you can imagine you don't have to go up too much higher in power before that starts to become a real problem for compliance. And, and it's purely because of distortion of, uh, of, of the grid voltages. Um, you can also represent the, um, the, the contribution of all of those individual harmonics into one figure called THD. Um, and that has a bearing then on what we define as power factor, which is the slide I was talking about earlier, which should be what we've got next. Here we go. Excellent. Um, so power factor, uh, most commonly defined in the past um, and a very common understanding of power factor is if you have a linear load, so not the, the, the distorted waveforms I'm showing you here, if you had a linear load uh, that was just some um, inductance and resistance maybe, uh, you would end up pulling a current, if you have some inductance there, which is out of phase with the voltage. Um, and you end up with this vector addition of power levels. So the real power would be, in that case, the power that's delivered to the resistor in that network. The reactive power is, or the VAR, is the is the the part that's essentially delivered or, or or is supported by the inductor, and the apparent power. This is our VA rating from a previous slide, is the vector addition of those two. Now the angle between the real power and the apparent power is our um, phase angle of this supply, and if you take the cosine of that, that's called the displacement power factor. So you can see that if phi is zero, so we have no phase shift between the, the current and voltage, then apparent power is equal to real power and power factor is unity, so everything's good. If you were driving a pure inductor here for a, a, a sort of bizarre reason, then your angle would actually be 90 degrees. You would, you would be delivering zero real power into that inductor because you can't deliver power into, into an inductor over time. And what would happen is you'd just be generating a huge amount of current flowing around in the system. So you're stressing the, um, the, the, the energy delivery network that's feeding this for doing very little useful work. So that's displacement power factor. However, I talked in the previous slide about distortion. 
there's distortion is a nonlinear effect, so it has a slightly different effect on power factor. And it's defined, the distortion power factor is defined as this ratio here, where the total harmonic distortion is the contribution, uh, the sum of squares of all of the individual harmonics that you can measure normally up to the 50th harmonic um, as a ratio of your uh, fundamental uh, current that you're delivering at 50 or 60 hertz. Um, and if you combine the, the distortion power factor and the displacement power factor together, you get a combined power factor, which is essentially a product of the two. Um, so in practice, your power factor you, you, you get from a nonlinear system will be something like uh, relating to this. Um, this is a slide I actually took from the from the internet. It's not something I've created, but it's a uh, people often use this uh, this analogy of power factor to try and give a, a physical concept to what it means. So, if you had a pint of beer, I, I hope you like this analogy. By the way, if you had a pint of beer, um, you can imagine. Well, if you don't like the froth on top of beer, you can call that the reactive power factor. I'm assuming you probably like the rest of it. So, the real power factor, the real power, is represented by the beer itself. And the apparent power fact, the apparent power in the VA rating is essentially the full glass. So if you, the analogy here is if you have a lot of reactive power, there's no room in the glass for any beer. Um, and essentially you get a bit disappointed. If you have unity power factor, then you, you have a glass full of beer and everything's good. So that's that's a, a fun little analogy that's very commonly used to describe the, um, the, the what power factor really is from a, from an energy perspective. The interesting thing is, in certainly in the UK at least, if you're using electrical energy at home, you're charged based on your use of real power. So your energy meter will be measuring uh, your the real power use and you get charged for that energy use. Um, you don't get charged based on the on the VA power that you that you impose on the uh, on the grid. However, um, for commercial applications where power levels are much higher, uh, the impact of poor power factor is quite severe. So commercial um, or commercial customers actually get billed based on the apparent power of their system. So this is and that is specifically done because of the amount of power levels that commercial applications are going to use. So there's a lot of drive now to um, to make sure if you're you know if you're if you've got a commercial premises or a big factory, you need to manage your VA rating. Otherwise, you get penalised financially. Okay, so that was um, a bit of an introduction to passive rectification and um, the sort of issues that you might face if you use standard passive rectification. Active rectification, this is where more complex power electronics starts to come into play to solve some of those problems. So the first example I'm going to give is a single phase example of active rectification. Now this um, is very commonly used uh, and has been for some time now on single phase systems. And what we do, we have the same front end bridge rectifier here, the, the, the four diodes, but we don't have a big bulk cap. We have a very small cap here for EMI filtering, but we don't have the big bulk cap there. And onto the output of that, we don't put our load. We actually put an actively controlled boost converter. So what happens now is when, or if you imagine the output of this bridge rectifier here, again, is this full wave rectified sinusoidal uh, waveform, what the, the way the boost converter is designed, uh, it, it will generate a 400 volt output typically. The way it's designed to operate is it will measure the input current that's being drawn um, on the mains and it will try to make that input current be a linear multiple of the measured input voltage. So it, you can see I've drawn a line here. This controller is measuring that full wave rectified sinusoid and it adjusts its operation to try and make sure that the current it draws is always um, a, a, a linear multiple of the voltage it's measuring at that particular instant. And by doing that, it will uh, essentially simulate a, a resistive load. It gives you a sinusoidal input current or a nearly sinusoidal input current. Um, and this sort of application uh, is very commonly used. So that's uh, that's been around for a little bit of time now. Um, it emulates the resistive load. Um, I've got an, uh, I actually had one of these systems running in the lab, so I thought I'd share a few waveforms just to show what this looks like. Um, so this is a scope plot um, where the red trace here, hopefully you can see the red trace, that's the full wave rectified sinusoidal output of the bridge rectifier. 
the um, the green trace is actually the current I've measured here flowing through the boost converter inductor. So that current, because we've got a switch in the system, the inductor current is switching up and down. But if you imagine the envelope that that's being, uh, that's being shown on the screen there, if you imagine a line going roughly up through the middle of that, you can see that approximately the, 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 the middle value of that envelope will be is following the red trace. So, and that means that the average or the current being pulled from the mains is roughly following the voltage. The sort of yellowy brown color trace is the switching node voltage of that boost converter. I thought I'd show a bit of a zoom of that. So this is the same plot, but zoomed in to show the switching behavior. So you can see here, this is why we have this, um, this envelope of behavior. There's, there's switching ripple on this particular converter. Um, the switching voltage here, when this prime, when this MOSFET here turns on, it drags the voltage down to zero. When it turns off, the current in the inductor flows through this diode. So we get it, we get the voltage across the MOSFET being clamped to about the output voltage, which is 400 volts here. Um, so you tend to see this sort of a waveform. This, uh, again, based on the standards, this approach is something that's commonly used above 75 watts uh, to, to mitigate those harmonic current problems. Um, in the example I'm showing here, it's actually about 150 watts of, uh, of power capability. So fairly low power, really. Um, this particular example runs at 65 kilohertz, and that's a common operating frequency uh, that you might find in these systems. If you go to higher frequency, you can start to reduce your magnetics component size a little bit, but you might start running into, um, in, into loss problems in your power semiconductors as well, or EMI problems start to become an issue. So 65 to 100 kilohertz is fairly common for this sort of an application. Um, the great thing is this is all this approach is also good for worldwide AC voltages and frequencies. Um, this operates as a boost converter, so you can design the power stage here such that it'll operate from 230 volts RMS or just in the US 115 volts. And actually a full range might be uh, 85 volts to 265 volts. You can design these power stages to cope with that full range and still deliver 400 volts on the output for the, for the downstream converter to use. So it's a very neat way of doing this. And the power factor I actually measured using the, the power analyzer in the lab for this example was 0.98. So that's, uh, imagine with, with the, the passive rectification, we got about 0.5. We've, we're getting very, very close to the ideal case of one with this active circuit. So this is a, this is a great and very commonly, uh, commonly used way to, to achieve this function. Um, what about three phase active rectification? Well, three phase is slightly different and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, the way it's commonly done is it uses an, an approach called an active front end or an active rectifier. Um, and really what happens, if you imagine, just trust me for the moment, that the output voltage here is, is constant. And in the case of a uh, three-phase um, rectifier like this, you might have a DC output voltage of somewhere between 750 and 800 volts DC because of the way the voltages work in a three-phase system. Um, and what we end up doing, uh, the way this control algorithm works, if you look at just one of these inductors here, um, on the input side, you've got the, the, the line voltage, which is just moving up and down with the, with, with the main supply. On the output side, you've got a switching network here, and you can control the average voltage on that network um, to set, essentially, this side of the inductor to have a voltage and phase relationship to the input, which you can control. So imagine that circuit schematic abstracted down to this set of equations here. On the input side, we've got our main supply, so VA sine omega t. On the output side, we can program the value of VB we want and the phase relationship or the phase with relation to the input um, supply voltage. Why do we want to do that? Well, if we can do that, then we can accurately control the current um, or the behavior of the current flowing through this inductor it, um, uh, to, to be what we want it to be. So we can control V, B and phase, and that will set the peak line current, the sinusoidal value of the, the, of the line current, and its phase relationship with respect to the input sine wave, the input AC. So by adjusting this output voltage, we can essentially program 
the phase current to have a magnitude and a phase relationship which is entirely controllable in our system. And that allows us to then, we can choose to set that to unity power factor if we want. And as I'll show you in later slides, you can do all sorts of, of other things too, which have some neat applications. Um, so we get near unity power factor if we want it in this AC to DC conversion cap uh, system. Um, the interesting thing is again, if you look at this topology here, we've got the diode, the, th the six diodes are, are there as we had in our original three phase passive rectifier, but we now have these active devices as well. And the really neat thing about this approach uh, for three phase active rectification is you can actually make the system bi-directional. You can either um, take AC input and turn it into high voltage DC and have power flow in that direction, or it's just a programming algorithm. It's just part of your control algorithm with exactly the same circuit. You can go from DC back to AC. Uh, so this is a phenomenally useful thing to be able to do in one, in one power stage. And I'll show some examples of that in, in just a moment. Um, we are talking about the, the actual control algorithm is slightly more complex to explain, and we're going to have some dedicated webinars later in this series talking about analog and digital control. The one we're using here is something called DQ Digital Control, and we'll cover that those details in a, in a later webinar. But um, yeah, watch this space because this is a fantastically clever way of operating this power stage. Um, at the moment, these systems typically use IGBTs running at 10 to 20 kilohertz. IGBTs, you can't run them much faster than that because of the switching loss um, that you would impose in the system. Um, and high voltage, uh, high voltage uh, silicon uh, MOSFETs also have problems with body diode behavior. Uh, so most of, most of these systems at the moment are using uh, fairly low switching frequencies. However, there are obviously silicon carbide um, devices now available which get around this problem. So you can imagine in the future these sorts of frequencies might start going higher. That does have some implications on the control algorithm used for this system here, uh, which I won't get into here, but um, I suspect over time the switching frequencies of these three-phase active front ends will start to increase a little bit and make these magnetics smaller. Um, we actually... Uh, experimented with one of these active front ends. We um, we built one in our lab using a rapid prototyping system just to get a feeling of how the control algorithms work and just just, just a really out of curiosity more than anything. This particular plot that I'm showing on the bottom is an example of where we've gone from a, a three kilowatt export, so essentially pushing three kilowatts from the DC link back out onto the three phase AC and uh, switching that to be a three kilowatt import in less than one millisecond, which I think is pretty cool. Um, if you see in the plot here, the blue trace is, well, we're showing just data from one of the phases here. The blue trace is the phase voltage. The green trace is the phase current. And the calculated brown colored trace here, that's just a calculation of the, of the, um, of the power that they, they represent. So you can see for the first half of this plot, the power is negative, which in, in the way we were measuring this here, negative power meant pushing power back out onto AC. Right halfway through this particular scope plot, we, we, we triggered our digital system here to, um, to, to, to immediately switch that back to import. Um, and you can see at that particular point, the current doesn't carry on up as it would normally do. It immediately carries on down. So you can see in less than one millisecond, the power has gone from being three kilowatts negative to three kilowatts positive. And I think that's pretty amazing that just with a, um, a change in the demand into that digital system, you can actually um, that quickly import or export power. Um, and I'll give some examples a little bit later on in, in, in some of the simulations that we're going to show you of why that's really useful. Okay, I, I hope you're still with me on this. Um, uh, it, it's, it's interesting stuff, I think. Um, why are single and three phase rectification topologies different? Um, I've shown you those two active schemes. The first one was our single phase scheme using the boost converter. Um, it works just fine on single phase, but why can't we just do the same on three phase? Well, the trouble is on a three phase system, you, if you were to have a three phase rectifier here and have the boost converter um, try to just track the input voltage, the, the boost converter doesn't, or, or can't do that properly because it doesn't it doesn't have knowledge of which phase is providing current at any particular time. It just doesn't work. Um, 
So the same question then really is, well, why can't we use a single phase version of this three phase active rectifier? Why don't, why don't people do that? Because then we get rid of this diode bridge on the input. Well, the answer is people are starting to do that. Um, in the past, this, this is theoretically what it would look like. In the past, it's, it's not really feasible to do this because if you were to use um, high frequency MOSFETs here, the body diode performance of those parts is so poor that you would just kill your efficiency. You just would not be able to operate them proper, properly. It, doesn't, it just doesn't work. Um, you can see here a bit of a zoom of that. It's this, it's this parasitic body diode. Um, and even very high performance silicon MOSFETs suffer from this problem. An example here, this is a, a superjunction part from Infineon. Um, very, very high performance technology, 600 volt technology. Um, so in the right application, that works fantastically well. Oops, sorry, I've gone too far. Um, the problem is if you look at the um, performance of the body diode, so you dig into the data sheet a little bit, you can see the reverse recovery time for that diode here is nearly 300 nanoseconds, which doesn't sound like a lot, but at high switching frequency, that is a huge amount. And the reverse recovery charge that you have to sweep out of the junction of that device every switching cycle is 3.6 microcoulombs, which again doesn't sound a lot, but when you start looking at the impact that has on system behavior, it's a huge amount, it's a big problem. The interesting thing though is, well, if you start using wide band gap technology, which um, some of you may have heard of, so gallium nitride or silicon carbide technology, one of the major benefits of those technologies is they just don't have reverse, they have a body diode, or at least silicon carbide does, but it doesn't suffer. It doesn't suffer this high QRR problem. It's a bit like silicon carbide diodes. They don't have a QRR to worry about. So that means we can get around that problem. And you'll, you may have seen in the, in the press in the last few years, there's a particular topology that has been pushed by uh, companies manufacturing these parts, which allows us to take to, to implement that single phase version of the three phase active front end. It's it's called something different. It's typically called a bridgeless totem pole PFC. Um, I don't know why it's called that. That just is, I guess, the way it's uh, the way it's been developed. Um, and it operates slightly differently in this particular example. So this is an example four kilowatt system, um, a demo system built by Nexperia using their GAN technology. Um, it's a totem pole PFC, and what it does is it uses line free. It uses normal silicon MOSFETs like the one I showed you here to operate at line frequency. So SD1 and SD2 are operating at 50 hertz or 60 hertz. And then the GAN devices, Q1 and Q2, they're run at high frequency. Um, uh, and they allow then the, um, the, 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 the active front end approach to work in this application. And in this application here, they achieved 99% overall conversion efficiency. Um, so check out that reference design if you want to learn a little bit more about Totem Pole PFC, because this is a topology which is becoming far more common now because you can start to get to very high performance levels uh, because you don't have a bridge rectifier drop now to worry about on the input. Just for comparison, I thought I'd show you the data sheet for this GAN part that, that was used in this application here. Um, if, if we compare the behavior of the effectively the body diode, there is a the body diode in that particular part or an effective body diode. It has um, a reverse recovery time of 54 nanoseconds. So um, it's much better than the, uh, the, the, the superjunction part. But look at this figure, the recovered, the recovered charge, reverse recovery charge, 125 nanocoulombs it's orders of magnitude lower than the reverse recovery charge in the um, superjunction part. So that's really what's allowing this sort of topology to become more mainstream now and get very high performance levels. Okay, um, now when I ran this webinar this morning, um, these images didn't come out too well. So I do apologize if the images you're seeing in your screen now aren't very clear. I will do my best to describe them and we can always have, a, have some questions afterwards in the in, in the in the question session at the end where we can talk about these a little bit more. Um, this is a simulation using Plex of a three phase active front end. So that topology I was talking about before. And in this case, it's actually a 25 kilowatt simulation running from a, a three phase input of 415 volts RMS. So 230 volts uh, line to neutral. Um, and it's using IGBTs in this particular situation. 
So I'm going to run the simulation and pause it as we go, because what I'm doing in the simulation is I just want to show some different events um, that I've um, dialed in as the simulation has been running. So if I click go, the system now has started up. If I just stop it at about that point there. Um, what you can hopefully see, if your screen can make it out, the top plot here, this is the um, this is the DC output voltage from the active rectifier. So the voltage being delivered to our resistive load on the DC side. So that's sitting at a nominal 800 volts DC. The next plot down are the phase voltages, the, the um, line to neutral phase voltages. And you can see they're looking nice and sinusoidal. The next plot down are the measured phase currents, which again are uh, nice and sinusoidal, and actually we'll zoom in later on some of these to show you how in phase they, they look. The next plot down is a measure of the reactive and real power, and this comes back into the DQ control mechanism. In this case here, the green line is 25 kilowatts, and that's representing the real um, useful energy, the, the power, the watts being delivered to our, or being, sorry, being drawn from our, our system. The red line is the reactive power, and that's essentially zero. The bits at the bottom here are the uh, are the device uh, switching waveforms, um, the voltage on the on the switching devices, which uh, again we'll zoom into in a little bit. So if I carry on playing that um, simulation, in a moment I've actually done a step change on the input voltage to this system. Hopefully, about now. Here we go. So if I pause at that point, ah, sorry. I'll let that run through again. Um, I had this problem this morning. <laughs> we'll let it run through again, and then I'll pause it again. Um, so at about this point here, there we go, if I pause it. Right, so just at that point there, what I've done is you can see I've just gone in and I've changed the three-phase supply to being rather than 230 volts line to neutral, I've gone to 115 volts line to neutral. So the three phase voltages have immediately dropped down to that lower level. Um, at the same time, you can see that the controller in the system has stepped up the phase currents because we're still trying to provide the same power level. So we need more current now. Um, but it takes a little bit of time for the controller to do that. So you see the output voltage momentarily dip down and then start to recover. Um, similarly, the output power drops a little bit and starts to recover. And then the switch currents you can see here are starting to increase accordingly as well. Now, if I carry on playing that, you'll see the DC link voltage comes back into a regulation. And then in a moment, I'm reduce, going to reduce the load. And let's see what that does to these waveforms. So let's just let it run a little bit. I think it's about now. Here we go. I'll let that carry on a little while. And if I stop it there, right, so what's happening now is at this point here, that's, um, uh, you, sorry, that if you look at the, 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 the real power, I've dropped the power demand now on the DC side from 25 kilowatts down to about 5 kilowatts. So what happens, the mains voltage doesn't change, it doesn't, it, the mains is effectively zero impedance at that point. The controller takes a little bit of time to dial down the mains current. And whilst it's doing that, the output voltage overshoots a little bit. And that's just because of the dynamics of the control system here. At the same time, we also get a reduction in the currents in the switches, as you, as you would expect. So if I allow, allow that to carry on, we're going to do a few more changes as we go. So let's let the next one go, which is, um, I think, yes, we've, we've dialed the voltage back up now. If I just pause it. So now with the same five kilowatt load, I've increased the phase to or the, the, the phase voltages back up to the 230 volts RMS per line to neutral. But we've still got only got five kilowatts. So now the, the phase currents drop even lower at that point, and we get a small overshoot whilst the control loop uh, essentially stabilizes. And if I carry on playing it, the next step change I make is I'm putting the load back up to uh, 25 kilowatts from five kilowatts. And you can see here, the output power goes back up, the currents go back up, and we get a momentary dip on the output voltage. So that gives you a good feeling of, 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 of the closed loop behavior we can achieve in these systems. If I just pause in a moment, yeah, there we go. Um, I've now zoomed in slightly to show you the switching currents that are being supported by um, uh, the, the, the phases here. 
um, in, in our system. So you can see that the, 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 they're all just essentially, uh, it's the PW, the PW frequency is what you can see here. Um, if we carry on playing that, and leave it to go for a little while here. Um, it's nearly through now. I think this is the plot I wanted to show you. Uh, if I can get it. No, I'll just move it, move it back a little bit. I think it was at that point there. Oh, okay, I'll just try playing it now. Yeah, this is the bit. There we go. Right. So this, I, I mentioned before I wanted to show you the phase currents and phase voltages zoomed in a little bit. So you can see here that the um, phase voltages and the phase currents are nicely in phase. Um, th there's no real issue here. This is a unity power factor system, and that's because of the control algorithm that we're using to, uh, to control this scheme. If I continue to play it, I think we're nearly done with this video now. If I stop at that point here, this is just a zoom in during one of those transient conditions where you can see how quickly the system is uh, responding and changing the phase currents to match the new load conditions or the new input voltage conditions. So I hope that uh, that's been slightly legible on your screens. Um, uh, if you have any questions about that, please do ask them at the end. But it, it does show you how neat this approach is for managing power flow in the three phase AFE. It's a, it's a very commonly used scheme now. OK, so DC to AC conversion or inversion. Um, this is the little portable system that I briefly mentioned right back at the start of this webinar. Um, uh, and I wanted to put this in. It's just a, 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 a perhaps a, a unique example of one way of doing an inverter in a very cheap and cheerful manner. These are the sort of things. It's that they're a few hundred watt rated. They plug in on your car, 12 volts. You can generate mains voltage. And the way they do it is they have an inverter stage here, as we've seen before but they don't run this inverter stage at high frequency. They implement what's called a modified sine wave. And what we actually do is those devices now run at line frequency, um, so they can operate at high efficiency. So they're running at 50 or 60 hertz. Um, and the idea of this system is it will generate a 50 hertz square wave output, or 60 hertz. But it, the important thing is that the RMS value of that um, square wave should have the same value as the required sine wave. So if we had a 230 volt RMS sine wave, we want to adjust the, 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 the duty ratio, if you like, of that square wave to give the same RMS content. And if you, you can calculate that using standard sort of um, uh, approaches in maths, and you can work out that the on time you need in each half cycle of the mains for that inverter to do that function is given by this expression here. Um, I'll show that graphically because I think it's easier to understand. Um, so in our system here, this example, we're running a 400 volt DC link. We want to develop a 230 volts RMS output and 50 hertz. If you put all that into the equation I just showed you, we get an on time of 3.3 milliseconds every half cycle. So here you can see the inverter is turning on for 3.3 milliseconds out of the 10 milliseconds, and then it goes low for the other for the remainder. If I just put a resistor across that output here, and looked at the average value of the power, when the average value of power, remember, is just energy delivery, um, after one main cycle, and compare it to what I would achieve if I had a sinusoidal voltage. So I've imposed the sinusoidal voltage over the top here of what you would get for 230 volts RMS. You can see the instantaneous power being delivered is different, but after one main cycle, the average power that has been delivered to this output is 2.64 kilowatts in both cases. So what we're saying here is that um, the, the, uh, this system, if you were to drive it into a resistive load, would be the same as plugging it into the mains. And that's the key part, is that most systems are not resistive, uh, as we saw earlier. So if we were to use this little box of tricks to, to drive our switch mode power supply front end, we get some awful problems because the switch mode power supply front end essentially looks capacitive. Even if you've got an active system here, you've got an EMI filter on the front end. So what happens is you're trying to impose a very high dV by dt across a capacitor. And the only way you can do that is to push a lot of current. Um, this is a simulation I just did in PSPICE to show this. And you can see here in this theoretical condition, even with some impedance in the line here, 
we're still developing over a thousand amp pulses coming out of this system. And in practice, if you were to do this, um, you, you would, you would, the, the, the system would probably fail. Uh, at least you would have a lot of audible 50 hertz noise because these pulses of current cause uh, everything to shake and move around. It's, it's not a great way to operate. And it's very, very inefficient as well. Um, if I skip through that, yeah, the current spikes are really what's hurting us here. Uh, it's, it's not a great system. You can, you can get versions of these which are more expensive. They're called pure sine wave inverters, where they've actually got the proper inverter in there and the smoothing inductors and everything else. This is a very cheap way of doing it, but I thought it would be useful just to put up as, a, as an example of DC to AC conversion. Um, so I've also, uh, hopefully, again, you can see this plot. This is a, a, a simulation in Plex of a motor drive. So we're actually using the same approach, this three-phase bridge, the active bridge that we've talked about. But we're going the other way now, and we're using it to drive a motor. This is the real benefit of using um, Plex for this simulation environment, because uh, Plex is multi-domain. You can implement or you can model mechanical and electrical and thermal and magnetic stuff all at the same time. So in the case of this motor drive, the purple lines here that you can see are mechanical uh, elements. So torque, speed and angle. Everything else is electrical here at the moment. Um, and this particular example, I just wanted to, to include it as, a, as a, to, to show more examples really of how electric vehicles can use this sort of technology. Um, looking at this, you might think, well, Where's the inductor in this? Um, in the AFE, we've got those nice inductors on the front end, which smooth the current out and, and, and reject that high frequency content. Um, in our scheme here, we've just got our two level IGBT converter. So the voltages being delivered to the motor are square waves. The great thing about the motor is it has native inductance. So we're actually using the inductance of the motor to, to smooth out and recapture the fundamental components that we want. Okay, so I'm going to show you two simulations here. Um, the first one goes quite quickly, and then I'll just pause it because there's some interesting stuff that's happening. So I'll just let it whiz through, and then I'll stop. There we go. Um, so this is this motor drive starting up. So initially, the motor's not turning. It's at zero RPM. And we're ramping linearly up, linearly up to 700 RPM. Um, with, a, with an external um, speed control system. So essentially, the, we're, we're operating with a speed demand into this system. But because you have inertia in the system, you can't generate speed in, infinitely quickly. There's also a torque limit. So what you're seeing here, the, the, the top right-hand plot is the speed of the motor in RPM. The bottom right-hand plot is the torque that the motor is developing. So we, we're saturating at about 16 Newton meters to, to, to accelerate the motor up. The top left plot is the phase currents that are being developed by the inverter. And then the bottom is just one of the phase voltages, just to, for, for reference, really. And the additional plot that I've just sat on top here shows the power that's being drawn from the DC link whilst, whilst we're going through this startup. So what happens is initially the motor's at zero speed. The uh, outer uh, control has to provide a lot of current to try and get the, mo the motor going. So you see initially a fairly high current that's determined by the torque limit we've got here. Um, after the motor has got up to speed, well, the currents then settle down to a sort of a steady state value and the torque relaxes down to its normal steady state value here as well. And on the power supply side of stuff, during the speed up of the motor, obviously we're pulling a fairly high impulsive power from the uh, from the link so about three kilowatts in this case once the motor's up to speed um you haven't got the inertia of the motor to think about anymore you just have um the standard sort of power that it's delivering um so that's all fairly good if i now go on look a, a little bit further on in this simulation i want to show you some interesting effects so i'm simulating the same thing now but at a certain point i'm going to demand a different speed if I pause the simulation there. So what we're seeing here is the same startup condition. We've got up to 700 RPM, everything's looking good. And then what I've done is I've gone in and demanded that the motor reduce its speed from 700 RPM down to 200 RPM. And to do that quickly, if you, the, the motor has inertia, you have to put a negative torque onto the motor to slow it down. You actually have to take energy out of that motor to slow it down. And what's happening here is you can see that whilst the motor's slowing down, while well, we're demanding negative torque, the interesting thing is, well, firstly, you, 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 you've got some fairly large phase currents happening again to drive that torque. 
but the phase currents now are operating in the in, in, essentially as a as, as a bidirectional system. We're taking the energy that was stored in the rotating mass of the machine, and we're pumping it back into the DC supply. And that's what's shown here. You can see here that the power on the the DC supply is no longer positive. During that speed change, it dips down to a negative value until we get down to the speed that I've commanded, and then it returns to positive again because we're just driving the load. This is exactly what happens in an electric vehicle when you hit the brakes. Um, you apply, or the, 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 the inverter applies a negative torque to the wheels to slow it down, and the, 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 the energy associated with the moving car then is return back to the battery pack. And that's how we get the region energy working. And that's the great thing about these power topologies is this bi-directional capability allows you to do that natively in the uh, in the control alg algorithm. It just works. Uh, and this is how you get that sort of level of performance. Um, I'll let those run on through. Um, in fact, I might just skip through. Um, so yeah, we're coming towards the end of the webinar now. Um, I'd like to give you a, a brief summary. Uh, passive rectification, you've seen from the start of this webinar that it works for low power systems, but it's really not a good idea for high power. And you're just not allowed to do it because of the harmonic content it generates. Um, those harmonics reduce the power factor effectively and they cause enormous problems for the grid. So the grid operators want you to pull nice in-phase current, uh, otherwise it causes them problems. Um, the active techniques I've described, both in, in both as an active front end or in a motor drive, can deliver power factors close to that ideal unity value. They can also be programmed to provide um, pretty much any power factor you want. So you can use these approaches to do hum, uh, to, to do um, uh, phase correction of currents if you've got an installation whereby you've got a poor power factor. You can use one of these systems with an artificially set. Um, phase angle to compensate for that. And there are, uh, there's commercially available, available electronic equipment for doing that at grid level. Um, the interesting thing I think is we're getting a convergence of topologies for AC to DC and DC to AC, uh, especially with the totem pole um, scheme for, for single phase AC moving forward. Um, so it's an interesting place to play at the moment. There's, um, there's, some, there's a lot going on in this area. The key thing is bi-directional power is possible, and that has a whole host of applications, especially in e-mobility. OK, I think that's me just about done. Uh, thank you for bearing with me on this uh, on this presentation. Um, we Let's see if we've got any questions coming in now. Let's have a look. It's just loading them up, so bear with me a moment. Yeah, oh, we have quite a few questions. That's great. Um, Okay. Yeah, there's a great question here. Um, uh, how does bridgeless PFC help in improving EMI performance? Well, that's that's a very good point. It, it actually doesn't necessarily. Um, you have to be careful because um, essentially right on the input to your system now, you've got high frequency switching. Um, you're still going to need um, an EMI filter on the front end. So if you start pushing the switching frequencies, EMI can become harder. And especially with the DI by DT and DV by DT that you're gonna get with common wide band gap devices, it's something you have to watch very carefully. So I don't think bridgeless PFC can really help in high frequency EMI. In fact, it might be more challenging. However, what it does do is improve efficiency. Um, Another question here, um, uh, someone uh, that sounds like they've had some fun with simulation themselves in the past. Um, power electronic simulation is a pain sometimes. What do you think about the best simulation package and how it is close to the practical implementation? That's a fantastic question. And um, I, I've, I've talked about this many times. Um, I remember when I was uh, um, doing my PhD, I, I had endless arguments with my supervisor about simulation because I would like to simulate something and take it to him. But um, he wouldn't believe me. He wouldn't believe the results of the simulation. And, and to be honest, he was right to do that. And the reason is it's not that simulation is bad. Simulation is fantastically powerful and a great productivity tool. But you have to know whether you can trust the results and you have to know how accurate the models are. Um, if you simulate a bad model, you're going to get bad results. It doesn't teach you anything. And the temptation, especially as you're in your early stages of your career in power electronics, simulation is easier than building stuff. I would recommend by far the same recommendation that my supervisor gave me. 
you're better off building things. You're better off learning by building stuff because then you can actually go and use simulation tools and query the results. You can actually make the models better. And then you get to this um, sort of virtuous circle whereby the simulation results and the real world results start to match. And when you have that, you start to get a real understanding of what's going on in the system and you can start speeding up your development cycles. Um, to simulate something without practical bench knowledge of the technology you're using is very dangerous because you just don't, you don't know whether you can believe it or not. And it's sometimes hard then to break out of that simulation cycle. In terms of tools, we use PSpice, or we use a couple of tools. PSpice is fantastic um, because you can, there's, there's lots of models available. You can create your own, you can create behavioral models, you can do all sorts of cool stuff. You can also use uh, the system called Plex, uh, which is a slightly different way of doing things. The Plex, and that's what I've shown you on the, on the webinar today. Plex models switching events infinitely quickly, and it does that to speed up the simulation time. And the great thing there is if you're trying to simulate something like a closed loop control of a system, the switching events aren't really the, of that interest. It'll cause you a bit of loss, which might affect damping in your system. But to a, to a first order, you can ignore the switching uh, behavior of the device and look at the bigger picture, the average behavior. Uh, and Plex and systems like that are fantastic for doing that. So the, I don't think there's one tool that is particularly good at one area. You need a sort of a mix of tools. There are other systems. I think PSIM is another one that uh, uses behavioral techniques. So there's all sorts out there. But um, yeah, you, you, the, the, the main message is, is simulation is fantastic, but don't use it as a way to avoid building stuff. Um, let's have another look through here. Um, yeah, in single phase PFC, when, the, when a sudden load is removed, is there a possibility of the PFC circuit being damaged? And if it's damaged, what's the reason and how to avoid this? So um, that's a good question. Uh, and it happens in practice. You know, the, the, the way a single phase PFC works is we have this outer voltage loop that is commanding um, the essentially commanding the multiplier that affects the, the waveform of the mains. So we actually that multiplication value has to be roughly constant over a main cycle. So we can't, for example, if, if, if we suddenly remove the output from our PFC stage and um, we have a very high bandwidth voltage loop that corrects the mains, we're going to end up distorting the mains under normal operation. So the outer voltage feedback loop has to be very slow, and that's what causes this overshoot behavior. Um, normally, there's enough capacitance on the output of a PFC such that the overshoot is manageable, maybe 10 or 20 volts, something like that. So it's not normally a problem. There are some advanced control chips that have a nonlinear control scheme, which um, uh, essentially dial up the gain if the error signal going into the error amp of that voltage feedback system um, if that error signal is too high, it will dial up the gain to quickly bring it back, but it doesn't operate in normal operation. So um, you're right, there can be problems, but it very rarely causes any sort of damage. Um, another question here, what's the maximum power level that we can achieve through a single phase totem pole PFC with wide band gap? And what are the drawbacks at a higher power level? Um, it's most of these limit the most limitations as you go up in power are generally thermally related. Um, uh, that tends to limit your ability to push higher power levels. The example I gave in this presentation was of a four kilowatt based uh, totem pole system, uh, and that was running at 99% efficiency. So um, if you do your maths on that, that means it's dissipating 40 watts, I think. So if you take that up and up in power and your thing's too small, it's going to get too hot. There's, you know, ultimately, you'll be limited by the capabilities of the power semiconductor devices. And ultimately, you wouldn't want to pull too much power necessarily from single phase anyway, because that creates an imbalance in the feed coming in. So at a certain power level, you pretty much want to go to three phase. Um, and then you can keep going and going and going. It's, you know, people do hundreds of kilowatts type power levels with these sorts of systems. Um, another question, do boost inverters have bi-directional capabilities? Um, I think it depends on the topology. Um, a normal boost converter has a diode on the output, um, so that will block current flow coming back the other way. So a standard boost converter, if that's what you're asking there, is not bi-directional. However, if it's, um, if it's an inverter stage whereby you're um, a bit like a totem pole or something like that and you're boosting up to a, 
um, a higher voltage level, well, yes, they can be bidirectional. It's the same. It's the same approach I've just described in the in, in the slides here. It just depends on what topology you're looking at. I think most bidirectional. You, you can only have bidirectional if you can control current in both ways through a switching element. So if you've got a diode anywhere and nothing else, it'll stop current flow in the other way. Um, let's see what other questions we've got. Um, uh, I can only do a few more because I think we're running out of time. Um, uh, yeah, there's a question here. Suppose we add fast recovery diodes. That should solve the issue of body diodes. That's an interesting question. I remember I remember asking my supervisor that one once as well. Um, the problem is, is if you look at, say, a 600-volt superjunction transistor, um, and, the, and the and the forward voltage drop of its body diode. If you were to use a, an ultra fast rectifier in parallel with that to do what you're suggesting to stop the body diode conducting, the trouble is is that the uh, the forward voltage drop of the external fast recovery diode is typically greater than the body diode. So what happens even if you put it in parallel, the body diode still conducts. Um, the best thing you can do really for situations where you're trying to push performance to very high levels and at high frequency is to start moving into silicon carbide or gallium nitride devices because the, the re reverse recovery is a horrible thing for power converters. It really hurts performance. And you're, if you can afford the, the cost in your, in your project, move over to silicon carbide and gallium nitride because this problem just really goes away. Um, I think I'll, I'll stop there. Apologies to those of you who've answered questions, who asked questions that I haven't had time to cover. I will come back on those. Uh, but I would like to say thank you very much for joining today. I appreciate your, uh, your, your time here and I hope you found it useful. Thank you very much. Bye bye.